All right, we're grabbing some fuel. I'm up the road here a ways now. Check this out. Anytime you can get... Ha. Ah, you guys ever run this stuff? It's called Roadmaster Premium from Senex. And uh, it's really good. It's really good diesel. Always ups your fuel mileage. I don't use it anymore because I use uh, Hot Shot Secrets uh, everyday treatment. But uh, anytime you can get Roadmaster Premium, I like to get it. Why people usually don't get it is because it costs like eight cents more a gallon, but you get better fuel mileage with it. Um, you, you just do. And so, uh, anyway, pull into this place, they got Roadmaster for uh, the same price as regular. Oh, oh. So anyway, I wanted to show you this tire. Remember I was just doing that free trip a minute ago. You can see the colors here. So when I'm running down the highway, the whole tire is black, right? You pull on the gravel and you get gravel dust on the, the whole tire. You can see this one. You can see what's white and what's not. So that's all that's contacting the road. So it's interesting, and I, I'm not a tire wizard as far as wear goes, but it's interesting that these innards somehow wear down even though they're not contacting the highway surface. Weird, huh? Anyway, good old tires. They'll, they're one of the weirdest things about trucking tires. <laughs> I know what you're thinking when you see that dirty. <laughs> Around my fuel cap, it's pretty gnarly. That's winter time. That's winter time running and dirt road stuff. Dirt road deliveries and winter time running. Things get a little bit dirty. Just don't want to let any dirt inside. We are giving her the stuffage. There we go. boy with some jake brakes okay let's go pay for this and see what kind of wintery we're gonna get into some stuff i have a feeling all right y'all yeah gotta turn that a little for you uh i think i have a plan i have a plan as you can see out the window nothing nothing much to worry about yet obviously um pretty good wind coming in from the north Right now, let's see, geographically, I won't name these towns because you won't know any of them. Uh, a couple of you might. Uh, I'm just north of Seabird, Colorado. Uh, Seabird is on I-70. If you continue on I-70, it would take you into Denver. Right now, Denver is locked into a raging behemoth. Cheyenne, Wyoming, which is up north on I-25, getting weather and wind. Um, to be honest with you, let me finish my route, sorry. So I am staying, uh, as you go towards Denver, you climb, you just slow climb up, like mile high, right? Mile high stadium. Denver is in a high plains elevation along with Cheyenne, Wyoming. So um, I'm staying east of there, uh, which is a lower elevation, which means, you know, less chance for precipitation. Uh, and I'm just picking these two lanes up. I'm gonna go from Seabird on up here to uh, Otis, Colorado from Otis up to Sydney, Nebraska, Sydney up to Bridgeport, Bridgeport over now, we're gonna cut over into Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, cut over to Torrington, Wyoming, jump on I-25. At that point, we're far enough north on 25 that we're off the High Plains elevation. Uh, you get north of Cheyenne, it drops back down lower elevation. Um, and there's no winter warnings and death bombs or nothing to worry about there. So. That's the direction I'm going. The freeway up in northern Wyoming was closed this morning. They've opened it back up. So by the time I get up there, all this craziness should be blown through. Um, old Cody or a Doonal, I like to call him Doonal. D-U-N-L, like Daryl, but Doonal. <laughs> he just got loaded out of Montana and is gonna start picking his way east with the load. And um, anyway, that's, that's kind of where we're sitting. So there's still some some, some things on my plate that I'll be uh, kind of worrying about. However, you may be wondering, now I'm gonna get back to what I just about slipped up and told you before, not slipped up, but try to stay focused. I get so many things in my mind. So many things in my mind. So, am I scared?
scared of driving through snow and stuff? No. But I will maintain that the greatest hazard for me on the road during bad weather is other vehicles. Dealing with other semis, dealing with um, cars, people that aren't very comfortable that probably shouldn't be out on the bad roads. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I talked about this on the podcast uh, a couple weeks back. Uh, in the wintertime, around the country in a lot of different places, there's some terrible pileups that happen. Um, I, I-80, Interstate 80 in Wyoming, Southern Wyoming is notorious for horrible pileups. And the reason a lot of those pileups happen is because there's people out in those storms that just don't need to be out in the storms. I mean, weather's a serious thing, you guys. It's not, oh, it's snowing, oh well, we're just gonna have to go. There's a lot of things that you need to prioritize in your winter life that make you it should make you pause and go, do I really need to, you know, go to such and such town today to do this or that? Um, from a trucking standpoint, do I really need to, does this load that I have on really have to, uh, you know, do I have to be on this road to get this load delivered on time? If I, if I decide to stop driving and get off the road and pull into a truck stop or a, an exit ramp somewhere, What's that going to do for my arrival time? If, if I'm hauling a load across the country, then I have two more days to deliver. Will it really matter if I'm out in this? Surprisingly, the majority of the time, the answer is no, you don't need to be out in this. Um, I know a lot of truck drivers worry about if, if they don't keep their load schedule, um, they might get some heat from their company they work for, they might get some heat from the receiver where they're unloading. But it is the right decision every time to get off the roads. If the roads are bad, it's the right choice every time to get off the roads, unless you have to be out there. If, if what you're hauling, um, if not being out there pushing through is gonna cause you know, some serious suffering, um, some hardship to whatever you're hauling. For example, if you're hauling some, something that had to get to a location, um, think, uh, you know, let's go extreme. Medical supplies. I have to get through the blizzard to get these supplies to the village. That's, that's push through stuff. Um, got a load of cattle on the back. If I just park here and, and sit and wait out the storm for 10 or 12 hours, these cattle are just going to be sitting back there hungry and, 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 and suffering. So I got to push through, right? A lot of the stuff, the bulk of the stuff that you see moving on the highways is not stuff that is time sensitive. And In vital. 10 miles, turn left onto US 36. There you go. It's not vital. Um, people might make you feel like it is. Your dispatcher might pressure you into feeling like you need to be there. But I guarantee this, in this day and age, if you pull over and get off the road and you tell your dispatch, I'm, I'm not driving in this. I'm done for the night. I'm gonna let the storm blow through. I'm gonna let the plows get out and clear things off. And you get fired for it, or you get some serious flack, or you get um, persecuted within your company for it. In this day and age, that's such an easy, like, wrongful termination lawsuit. Or like, you go and tell a lawyer, "Hey, I got fired because I was scared for my life or others. By dri I was going to cause harm to others by driving on the road or potentially myself. So I pulled over and I got fired for it. That's like an open shut, bing bang boom, <laughs> done, done, done." right so remember that you don't don't get bullied into feeling like you need to be on the roads uh, those pileups I was talking about they often occur because somebody finds themselves in a situation that they're just way out of their depth and not in a bad way again this is we live up in this country they're like we we're born and raised we were born on the ice <laughs> so but if you're from you're back east somewhere down south and you find yourself up here trucking and you're just just horrendous blizzard absolutely no way you should feel like you need to be out on it so those pileups occur because someone gets driving so slow or even will stop sometimes that boom they get rear-ended and then boom 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 and of course it's a chain reaction pileup and causes literally literally millions and millions multiple multiple millions of dollars of damage which you know hurts your insurance rates not just for the people on the wreck, it hurts everybody's insurance rates. I mean, if you have a real bad winter, I guarantee insurance rates are going up across the board for everyone to make up for all those losses. So,
so uh, anyways that's just my uh, two cents that's why I'm not going through Denver I just I I can handle the roads it's the, the, the vehicles around me or the sudden slowdowns in traffic when there shouldn't be slowdowns in traffic or you know so on and so forth anyway um, as you probably noticed there's a lot of monologues in this video but it's trucking and it's inclement weather and so that's the way it is <laughs> Okay, coming back to you, getting a little bit of an update for you, I guess. Um, actually, this is going to come in the form of a tip. doesn't matter if you drive semi-trucks, if you drive cars, if you drive a bicycle. <laughs> this is going to be a tip. A little boy out there fixing a little fence in the cold. Yeah, a baby. So, um, you see the roads here are wet. See in my mirror? See that back there just spraying water? Look down, you can actually see my front tire spraying water out. Um, contrast that, if you will, with my outside air temperature gauge. See that? 23 degrees. And snow sticking on the, on the ground around, but on the roadway, it's not sticky. Which means the roadway is warm, obviously, and the road spray Oops, the road spray coming from my rig uh, would show that it's wet. Now, there's going to be a, a moment here where we, everything kind of comes together where it's going to go from being wet to being frozen. Uh, like when I pass a semi right now, by the time my wipers wipe, it's already frozen on my windshield. So, the air temperature is very cold and the surface temperature is not. Like there's a truck past me just blowing water. It's 23 degrees out, so somewhere along the line here it's going to freeze. And the main indicator of this that you want to watch for when you're driving, you watch that mirror like a hawk. And watch that spray coming out of my tires. When that spray disappears, you are on thin ice, literally. So that's what you want to watch for. If you're in a car and you're cruising along, um, this would create, actually this would create exactly what they call black ice. Because the road looks wet, you're like, oh it's wet, but it's actually not. It's going to turn into a pure, just a sh thin sheen of ice that looks wet. So uh, watch for that, okay? There's no road spray, it's icy. And you don't want to hit your brakes, you don't want to hit your gas, you want to just coast until you're down to a comfortable, manageable speed. So, you heard it there, you learned a little something, right? Watch that spray. See right there? Sterling. At the next stop sign, turn left. Thank you. Sterling Correctional Facility. Sterling, Colorado. Still getting road spray, you guys. It's bumped up a degree to 24, though. So, ideally, like in a perfect world, you want it to get dry before it gets cold. You don't want it to go from warm to cold while it's dropping the precipitation situation. But uh, that's where we're at, Sterling, Colorado. You've been there, you know it. One of the main things that you always see around the prisons <laughs> is signs that say, prison, right? Do not pick up hitchhikers. <laughs> because, you know, they... <laughs> it's funny that they take the time to put the sign up because you're like, how many prison breaks do you have? Like, is it kind of normal? Like, you're always dealing with prison breaks? No, but they put signs up that are like, don't pick up a hitchhiker around here because there's a good chance they're escaped from convict. <laughs> like, huh. so what are the chances that somebody happens to be hitchhiking in the same area as prison? It'd be like this crazy combination that if the two overlap where you get a prisoner who's a convict at the same time, crazy. So anyway, I'm driving by the prison and I look at the, the entrance ramp to the freeway and there's somebody out hitchhiking. Not going the direction I am, or I would have picked him up. That would make for some great content for you. Picking up a hitchhiker, having an interview with a hitchhiker on YouTube. Uh, have you picked up a hitchhiker before? I've picked up a few over the years. Um, you know, hitchhiking. Like when I came out of high school, it was kind of like a like, like man, can you imagine just like hitchhiking and just oh, just go. Oh, it'd be crazy cool, right? So of course we never did that. But in order to kind of live vicariously 
through a hitchhiker. We, you know, pick them up from time to time, and I was always incredibly disappointed. He'd be like, "So, is it just like?" And they talk about what they did, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm always hungry, and I can't find anything to eat." And then I got stuck in a storm, and you're like, and I know some people are hitchhiking for, at least back in the day, for fun, and some are hitchhiking because they have no transportation. But um, it kind of cured my. I realized after a few, that you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't think it would be cool to to live the hitchhike life and bum around the country. You know? One thing, if you don't have any other options, but to do it by choice, it kind of cured me of the uh, curiosity. So instead, I became a Billy Bullrack here and uh, figured we'd see the country that way. Young, or am I faking on the tip of my tongue? There's a sarcasm waiting for you. Well, you guys, a little update from the road. I think we made a good decision by not going to Denver and Cheyenne. It's just about to Scott's Bluff. This is the last little valley you drop down. Um, this is kind of old pioneer country. This is where all the, the old pioneering folks from back in the pioneer days would bring their wagons across through here um, in this valley. I'm not sure if they call it the, is it the Platte River Valley. Someone probably knows it can correct me, but um, anyway, they'd follow this river, the valley and whatever, kind of right on through here, over through Wyoming, over there by Muddy Gap and all that, and then into Utah. From there to California, or wherever they were going. So, anyway, it's kind of a cool little gap you shoot through there, but uh, the, obviously, as you see, the weather's cleared up. Um, the road closed somewhere up in Wyoming at the moment, so somewhere along the way, we're gonna get back into some some weather, but for now, we'll uh, we'll take the respite. I, I can't even say the respite, because I haven't truly hit any horrible stuff yet. Uh, one thing I want to impress upon you, if you're ever doing weather stuff, don't over embellish the weather. In 10 miles, turn left onto US 26 West. Yes, every time I start a video, she tells me. So anyway, don't don't over embellish the weather. I'll tell you a quick example. So uh, my boy, my driver, my man, Doonal, he loaded back out of Montana this morning. And right out of the town that he loaded out of, there's a mountain pass. And somebody else had earlier that morning told me that while they were followed the story now, while they were while they were fueling up, a cow trailer came in from over the pass. An empty cow trailer coming in to load as well. And he said, man, it was it was chains only. They had the chain rule in effect on the pass, which you know, very rarely did they ever put the chain rule up on that pass, even when it's really bad. And uh, the bull rat guy said, but I didn't have any chains, so I you know I come up and over. I didn't really have any choice, and I made it. So we know that an empty cow trailer made it over that pass. So Cody loaded and was loaded going the opposite direction over the pass. Well, the same guy that gave me the info that morning texted Cody, mutual acquaintance, and said, hey, chain rule in effect on the pass, good luck. And that was it. Didn't give the full story, see? Didn't say chain rule in effect on the pass. However, I learned it from an empty truck that came over with no chains empty. So can't be horrible. I mean, it's bad, but it can't be like impassable if you came over with no chain. So anyway, you're loaded. You should be good. Good luck. It's important to be realistic about things. I know it's fun sometimes to embellish how bad the weather is, but it's really important when you're on the road to just share the factual situation, if that makes sense. And that probably applies to a lot of things in life. We get it a lot in the news, right? The news is forever more so now than ever, but forever the news has always hyped, you know, fanatical things like, you know, the way that they, in newspapers, the way they make headlines is to catch your eye. And so oftentimes I think when we share information with each other to try to make some excitement, we simply state the headline. We don't uh, put any body into the article, so to speak. We just state the headline. So that's your tip of the, uh, tip of the hour.
vapor in the air. You can see when uh, when cars are coming at you with their high beams on, it shoots a beam straight up into the air. It always does that in the winter when there's when there's moisture in the air. So uh, we're just about back into Montana, topping off with some fuel because I know the fuel up here is treated for the winter time. I'll pick up some treatment to put in it as well for later tonight. It's about six degrees right now and it's supposed to get, well, very much below zero. Still calling for 15 below zero uh, where I'm headed to, so yeah, <laughs> frosty. See all that good action? It's just from the road spray. y'all it is uh it's 2 a.m it's 10 below zero i'm in uh just a little bit west of bozeman montana it's cold man cold montana gets cold but this is unseasonably cold for november but is what it is part of the deal so um what i'm gonna do i'm getting out i'm gonna treat my diesel with some power service um i'm, I'm not quite ready to stop for the night yet i'm gonna drive down the road a ways but I want to get this stuff in now because if uh, sometimes if you put this in when you park, it doesn't mix through your tanks very well and uh, it doesn't help keep your diesel from gelling up. So I'm going to put it in now and then start going down the road again. It'll slosh in the tanks and mix in and then get sucked into my fuel system. That way when I do pull over, um, it's so cold tonight I'm going to have to leave my truck running um, just to keep the fuel warm and the air system warm. A cool thing that semi engines do, um, they suck diesel up out of your tank and they bring it up to the engine. It brings it into the injection system, into the engine that's very hot. And then it only uses, you know, half the fuel or less. And the rest of the fuel that doesn't use it sends it in a return line back to the tanks. And so that's actually hot diesel that it sends back and dumps in the tank. Um, so I'll show you with the camera when we go out here, I have a heat gun, I'll show you. Um, you'll see even at 10 below, the diesel is probably gonna be, I don't know how warm, but it's gonna be quite a bit warmer than what's outside. So I'll show you that. So because the truck circulates hot diesel like that, I probably could get away without this stuff tonight, but it's $20 a jug, you put half of it in each tank, and uh, then you don't have to worry about it. If I did end up gelling up, you know, while I was parked, it'd just be a huge pain in the morning. So let's go put this stuff in. We'll get all squared away. That way we don't gotta worry about stuff and uh, we can get on down the road, huh?
Okay, let me show you this. Put this in there. Grab my heat gun. Okay, so let's check. Uh, see that? That's the frame of my... Hold on, let me get my light rigged up. saw that um <laughs> you saw that heat gun the frame of the truck was like well parts of it was below zero the metal was and then some of it was like just a little above zero i shot the the heat gun into the liquid into the diesel it was like first it was 57 then it kind of settled on about 47 degrees so even though it's 10 below outside and i'm going down the highway that hot diesel that comes back in is keeping that tank at 40 45 degrees so that's good we like that um that's really good um and then you saw like i, I heat gun the side of the tank and even the sidewall of the tank is like 25 degrees so it's keeping it good so like i said you may you may get away without treating your diesel but here's a situation when you'd want to have it if i have some kind of trouble or some kind of a breakdown or you know, my alternator goes bad and my batteries die or just anything like that. If my diesel's not treated once my truck shuts off, it's not gonna have that hot return if I had a, you know, a shutdown situation. So ideally, yes, everything's gonna run and idle and be fine at night and stay warm, but you always wanna be prepared for worst case scenarios in the cold. So worst case, have some hiccup. My truck would be sitting until morning and uh, the diesel would be treated so when we fixed whatever the issue would be, we could uh, we could fire up and still go and not have to worry about being gelled up. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, let's get back after it and get this get this diesel worked into the engine. <laughs>
good last night, y'all. The uh, the winter treatment worked out really well. Um, ended up uh, parking and sleeping there down the road a ways, and I think it was 11 below zero where I parked. No, uh, no problems, no problems. Everything went good. Truck idled smooth, and uh, it was good. Slept, uh, slept a little. It's hard to get a lot on my mind sometimes with all this trucking stuff and the weather and the. All the other guys out in it, and hoping you know everything's going all right and things are working well. So it can be a little hard to unwind and fully utilize the time you have to sleep sometimes. But but we got her so uh, got out to Missoula in really good shape and uh, got loaded this morning. Those calves were horrible, horrible. And I'll be honest with you, it's something a little bit with Western Montana cattle. I'm not sure what it is can't put my finger on it but even old rooster says that they were the same way back when he used to haul cattle out of western montana uh in the late 80s and early 90s you know 30 some years ago he said they were this the same way which is they're just very like lethargic they, they can just be real uh when, when we're working animals we call them kind of deadheaded where they're just sort of like kind of like the uh maybe some of the uh people that like to partake a little too heavily on the uh marijuana <laughs> they can just be kind of like uh. in fact i had a guy tell me one time he's a friend from colorado and he's like i love i love smoking weed is what he said he goes but here's the big problem and i don't mean this to become a thing but he goes my big worry about people being able to smoke weed do the reefer, breaker, breaker, freight shaker. They said it makes them really just, just become really okay with doing nothing, just being like, eh. which is all, you know, that's kind of the surfer, hey, bro, you know, that's how it's always been portrayed. But these cattle were similar, and it could be that they're from Western Montana, which is kind of the side of the state that really likes to partake in the, <laughs> in the, uh, the cannabis, <laughs> the marijuana. And I don't know if there's just enough of that secondhand smoke drifting around, around Missoula, that these calves are just like, hey. And then combine that with a really cold night, you just, you just couldn't, you just wouldn't go. Like, normally you could load the whole bunch kind of at once and they'll just file up and in. I had to load like small little bunches at a time, in and out, in and out, in and out. Anyway, we got them on. They're, uh, what's it called when they put them in? Uh, they're in detox. <laughs> <laughs> right now we're getting some fresh mountain air as you've seen and uh and we're rolling so we got from missoula to, to grand island it's a it's a haul you guys it's another it's another 1100 mile run so probably my last run for the fall though to be honest with you um probably my last fall for the run in fact i would say right now is as good a time as any <laughs> to fill you in on the fall situation so normally, let me tell you what our normal fall run is, okay? Our normal fall run is, come Labor Day, we start getting phone calls, start hauling cattle out of the sale barns across the state, out to the Midwest. We do that, not crazy, but steady through September. Then October rolls around, and by the first week of October, you're getting busy. You're getting phone calls nonstop, you're telling people no more than you're telling people yes when it when it comes to hauling cattle for them because you just don't have enough truck capacity. That continues all through October, all through November, right up until Thanksgiving, sometimes even through Thanksgiving. Um, and then you have a little break. Everyone takes a little breather. And then first week of December, whoa, comes flying back in, hammer, 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 right till Christmas Eve. <coughs> That's typical. And then we have Christmas break, and then January ends up being pretty busy as well because, you know, they had two weeks off for Christmas, and there's people that want to sell their cattle after the first of the year for maybe for tax reasons and defer some of their income into the next year. So you have a little spurt again in January. And then the rest is, you know, February, March, April, just kind of cattle are just, they're, they're slow. You know, I cut the crew back to just, you know, one or two guys. And uh, anyway, that's a normal year, okay? So let's uh, do the sands of time. Talk about this year. 
this year had zero cattle calls in September. <laughs> Maybe one or two, but virtually none. <clears throat> the cattle that we haul in September are usually cattle that uh, are kind of teenaged, so to speak. They're not babies, but they're not adults. They've spent the summer out on grass, and in September, they bring them in off grass and ship them to the feedlots in the Midwest. And because of the drought, there were no cattle on grass last summer here. They just, nobody had grass to put teenage cattle out on. They, they sold them all last winter instead of keeping some of them to put out on grass. So September was dead. October, the first two weeks came and went with nothing. October kind of 15th until like the first week of November, crazy. So about three weeks of just like insanity. And then the second week of November, nothing. I mean, a couple things, but but nobody was busy. I mean, I had I had guys where I'm like, hey, you take three days. And they're like, what? I'm like, take three days. Okay. And then we had this week that I'm in the midst of right now. And everybody has gone crazy this week. We've all been running our guts out this week. And it's because Thanksgiving is coming and the market is, is pretty strong right now still. Well, it's, it's faltering, but it's decent. And so everyone's like, sell your stuff. And we had this big winter storm the last you know week or so where we've got all this all this snow piled up. Nobody wants to have to feed their cattle. So they're like, let's sell all the extra stuff we've been hanging around. Let's get them gone. So this week's been wild. Thanksgiving is going to come. And post Thanksgiving, I don't know this till it comes, but post Thanksgiving, I'm not expecting much for cattle. I'm expecting, you know, I'm gonna try to keep like three guys, you know, busy. I'm gonna remove myself from the pool, so to speak because I want my guys to be able to have more loads. I don't wanna, I don't wanna put myself in there and take loads from them by, by putting myself into the load pool, you know? Because I know, it, I know it's gonna be slower. I think we'll still have loads, but it's not gonna be crazy. I'm hoping that I can get, you know, maybe two loads a week for the guys, you know, for, uh, for three or four of my trucks, and that'll kinda keep guys going through Christmas. So for me, I'm gonna be going to do some other stuff. I don't know, what? Um, we'll see. I'm not gonna do peak season work. In the past, I've hauled packages for UPS. I've hauled for FedEx. Um, I'll make, maybe I'll make, I'll, I'll talk about it some other time. It's kind of a different direction, but uh, that used to be the Wild West. It used to be fun. It used to be like, this is, this is crazy. It's good money. It's all gone. It's all been gobbled up and corporatized and, you know, it used to be a it used to be a crew of us guys, a bunch of us cow haulers would uh, would come over from hauling cows and show up at UPS. You know, <laughs> like hey, we're here to move some prime, baby, and uh, it was sweet. You know, a few years of doing that was really good. And then UPS changed their structure to where all those local guys just they didn't. You don't deal locally anymore. It's all you deal with some hub somewhere across the country. And you're like, no, no, you don't understand. We got this little core of bull haulers and we can roll, you know, rain, wind, sleet, snow. No, they don't know. You're just another truck to them. So you're like, you know, forget it. And then of course the rates come down when they do that and cause they get everybody involved. And then FedEx was good money last year, but the company we worked through that had the contracts last year apparently got blown out of the water this year. They won't even return the emails, which is dumb. After all the work we did for them, they won't even they won't even communicate. So you're like, you know what? Fuzz off. So it won't be that, but uh, you know, I have that new hopper that I bought. Remember that one that I brought home with the cab over? I need to get in the shop, put a couple tires on it, and, and get the wiring wired in so that it matches this truck. And maybe we'll go out and do some hopper stuff, you know? We got a couple band gigs, uh, kind of surprise gigs that popped up in November, or excuse me, in December. So I've got a couple weekends there, but I need to be home for doing music. And then of course Christmas on the tail end of the month. But uh, we might have a couple weeks in the middle of December there where we might just hook on the old hopper and go for a spin, see how that thing works. But uh, anyway, that's the fall run. So why has it been so slow and bad? Uh, it's weird because the rates have been actually pretty solid because the fuel prices are just ridiculous um, here's why it's here's why it's been so bad for the last two and a half years three years we've been in drought people have been selling off their inventory 
So when you sell off inventory, obviously you have less on the shelf, right? So all these cows that nobody could feed, we had to sell. You've seen some videos in the past, um, even from two summers ago, where we hauled cattle out to Nebraska. And uh, that catches up over time. You get rid of all these mama cows. Mama cows are what produce calves. Calves are what produce loads. So you can only ship so many thousands and thousands of cattle out of the state due to the drought before you go. Huh. Like a lot of the state came out of the drought, you know, the western half and the far eastern part portions. But it doesn't matter how much rain you have, you don't have mama cows anymore. And those take years to build back. You can't just, boom, we have 100,000 mama cows back in Montana. It takes time to cultivate and raise new mamas up. So I, I would, in a nutshell, say the fall run this year, the, like the fall run, the craziness, where in the past we dealt with uh, eight weeks of crazy. This year was three and a half weeks of crazy. Um, I would expect that next year will be a similar scene. Um, and then hopefully by the third year, we'll be getting back up into our into our former numbers. But anyway, I've been holding that out for a long time. Not for any reason. I just kept forgetting to fill you in on the fall run situation. So Well, it appears we have a little excitement going on at the feedlot this morning. I'm not sure if it's training. I don't think it's training. I think it's a... I think it is a real fire. Of course, it's it's on the cleanup now, but here comes old Spencer, I think. We'll see what he's got to say here. Huh. Oh, you got a little fire. A little excitement, huh? Yeah. Oh man, what happened? I don't know. We've got some ground corn stalks delivered, and I think it must have started when oh, we loaded some up. Something weird something there. Something got a little hot. I'll be darn. Yeah. Didn't do nothing, did it? No. Just right Just here. right there. <clears throat> yeah. I was worried the <throat> down in there and clear that. Yeah. Oh man. I think we got it though. Sort of. Huh. Right uh, on. Might be able to get through there. I don't know. Yeah, if, uh, let's see. I'll see I, if they can move that other Just one. that tanker looks like he's moving tanker, it now. Yeah. You want me to cut over on the concrete over here? Or just drive through the... I think he can go straight through there. It's fine now. Okay. If he just would back up a little bit. Yeah. I'll go talk to him. Cool. <laughs> that mean got all that tank? Uh, no, Corey had his numbers wrong. So I ended up with 88. 88? And then the next truck coming has got 106. When's that one coming here? <laughs> It'll be tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Okay. Well, it sounds like I would assume a lot of that got edited out because the language was a little salty there coming in the window. <laughs> so they got they took delivery on some corn stalks for feed, just some ground up corn stalks, and something in the corn stalks was on fire. Something was hot or something when the truck unloaded them. So those corn stalks lit on fire because they're super dry and then the fire jumped over here to the ditch and there's a lot of old, uh, old everybody calls it something different but a lot of like kochia fireweed over there growing from from summer by the lagoon there and uh, yeah it got things uh, got things moving the wind's blowing down here pretty hard too so <laughs> but the old Cairo Nebraska fire department Hip hop, the hippity hop, Johnny's on the spot. Flip around this building. I don't know that I can properly convey my happiness that I'm here. You guys have been with me on a long journey. I'm not sure if this will end up in two parts or one or what, but probably might be broken into two episodes because it's quite a bit of trucking we did here. But uh, this would be a very, uh, this is very typical of a Nebraska feedlot here, kind of a kind of a farm feedlot. They grow corn, you know, around the yard and then uh, feed cattle here in the deal. We'll get these unloaded. I'll give you guys a few final thoughts and maybe a bonus washout at the end. And let 
you get back to your days, huh? Man, oh man. Well guys, we're, uh, we are kind of playing the, playing the time game here. So I got unloaded, everything went great. I'm fading fast. I've only got so much energies left before I call her a night. And I need to get washed out. And uh, it's like 30 degrees, the sun's shining. So inside the trailer right now, it is actually still thawed out. It's not frozen yet. A Little bit of it is, but the bulk of it will wash right out. So I hustled my buns to get back here. And uh, wouldn't you know, there's two guys in already washing right now. This is a quiet little country washout in Ainsworth, Nebraska that I love using. The owner of it is a, just a really nice little fella. And it's been real good to, to work with over the years. Um, Anyway, so here we are, waiting for these guys. Got a Thompson truck out of Billings, Montana, and an Ickstad, I don't know where he's from. I don't recognize him, but this guy would be uh, considered a neighbor, I guess, technically, right? But uh, anyway, I, hope, I think they'll get washed and get out of the way, and I should be able to. It's looking like this guy's gonna win the race between the two of them. So I'll back into this one and uh, I think I got about an hour or so left before, before the sun goes down. Once the sun goes down, it'll get a little tricky, but but uh, that's the plan. Let me show you guys how this washout works. I need to walk around a little bit anyway. I want to show you how this goes. It's kind of cool. Okay, so right here, man, you can see how icy it is from the last couple days. Normally they back their trailers right down to the bottom but they're not even getting close anymore because there's so much ice and gnarliness. They're afraid of getting stuck. But uh, concrete, it's all covered. You can't tell now. Those are, that's concrete the trucks are sitting on. And then of course the poo water flows down into this lagoon. So uh, once the lagoon fills up with uh, poo and water, there's two things that happen. One, check out this big old Check out this big old boomer. Whoa, <laughs> that's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, big old long reach excavator. They'll reach in there and dig the poo out, the solids, and they'll put the solids down in this pit to dry out. See down there? So solids go in there, they'll dry out. And then the liquid, this is where, this is where it gets pretty cool. Some, some Nebraska ingenuity. So the liquid, I'll probably be back here in the spring sometime. I can actually show you this live and work it. But he's got a big pump over there. And the pump pumps it out of the lagoon over here. In fact, here's his pump right here. This is pump setup. It's all in the weeds. But anyway, that sucks the juice, the water out of the lagoon. He's got pipes over there on the trailer. Those pipes get laid out here during the growing season. And he irrigates his corn with uh, with gated pipe. So pretty cool. Corn husks with no corn because they combined it all. But so all this this field here all gets irrigated just from the water. So of course the water's high in nitrogen, and plants love nitrogen. So the corn utilizes the nitrogen. The water goes back into the earth, filters through the ground. The solids go into the pit, and once they've dried out and whatnot, well, not dried out, but once he's got them in there where they can sit, they'll put that in the manure spread and they'll spread it out around here as well. So kind of a cool full circle cycle, because um, you got to remember the manure obviously is grass and water, you know? It's, it's all just processed grass from the old cattle. But uh, I've always like, I've always thought these setups are just cool. Just because you're like, man, it's just like this perfect fertilizer system. Nice little cash crop he gets off the corn. Corn's worth like, it's like, it's like as valuable as gold. Go. But uh, I'm going to bring you guys along if I don't get too, man, look how, uh, see all this white? That's all 
salt. That's all courtesy of South Dakota. But it's getting shady in there. And when it gets shady in there, it'll start freezing fast. Uh, if you're wondering, if it does freeze, I can go back up further into South Dakota and there's a hot water washout where they have a, a natural hot spring that comes out of the ground and they use the hot water from it to wash cow trailers out. But man, we really need a, we really need a rinse. So you can just see all that left on there. Of course, that all just corrodes and eats, eats away. So I'll, uh, hopefully it's light enough. I can capture some of this washout for you guys. And uh, that'll be that. We'll boogie on back up to, to Montucky. You guys, that's done. I can't believe we got it done. It actually, it's weird, it's, it's warmer now. It's supposed to warm up here tomorrow quite a bit into the 40s. It's like 27 right now, but it's totally dead calm. So it actually feels warmer now than when I was giving you the tour there an hour and a half ago. Good old cattle trucks. This is what I like to see right here. Old flat top freight liner. <laughs> Oh man, okay, so. Let's see, today is the 19th. Looks like he had one, two, three, about four washouts yesterday. He'll have four, four since I've been here today. So not a bad little deal, they charge uh, $40. For like the longest time here, he was, uh, he was $35. Keeps the place clean. Bill Michaels is his name in Ainsworth, Nebraska. If you're ever trucking through here, it's on the west end of town. It's not like insane pressure, but it's like, it's just enough to get it done right. And he always keeps his pad cleaned off. Everything always works. Some of these, uh, some of these places, they just, they don't get upkept very well. So you roll in to use it and maybe the hose isn't working right or the nozzle's busted or something like that. And uh, that's never the case here. And the man's a patriot. <laughs> but uh, that's why I like it. So we're gonna go up the roadways. I'm in good shape now where I'm poised to, uh, to get home in good shape tomorrow since I'm all washed out. Uh, it's good, you guys. I'll give you a few parting thoughts before I bunk down tonight. 
but uh, let's get down the road a little ways go grab some dinner and uh, now we can just stop and go to bed once we're uh, once we're tired well you guys closing thoughts well, I got washed out last night I got uh, I got an amazing sleep slept like a rock slept wait wait slept like a baby solid as a rock and it was solid I felt good really nice however I am I brought you guys along on probably what was one of the more grueling weeks that I've had. We covered a lot of miles and uh, saw a lot of country and gave you a lot of monologues, which it's kind of the nature of cow hauling. Um, I kind of hope to, to have more time to share more and show more of what's going on and maybe fly the drone and get some, some cool footage and you know set up and do more b-roll and get some tasteful shots for Matt to edit in with the you know with the music but it the week was just we were just a half a step behind on all the loads just gotta go gotta go and then on top of that I brought you guys along on on like two back-to-back -back monster loads we went all the way to Texas that was 1350 and then I actually drove back uh, my, my reload from Texas was like 1500 miles to get back to where I loaded or more. It was a long way. I went clear back to Missoula, which I didn't realize until I'm telling you this now. It was a whoo. And then from there, it was a, it was a 1100, and some, I can't remember the preset miles, but it, it was 1100 and some miles to Nebraska and then 900 miles back home. I'm, I'm getting close to being home, which is why I'm wrapping this up. I hope you guys enjoyed, you know, a little bit of a little taste of bull hauling coming along. It's it's a lot. Um, if you've ever thought about hauling livestock, I'm not going to discourage you from it, but I just want you to realistically understand it is unlike anything that you've ever done. Um, it's not for everybody. And, you know, people ask, I get asked a lot personally how you do it. Well, I don't know that I would be able to do it if I wasn't raised doing it since I was a teenager. If I hadn't been hauling livestock since my teenage years uh, with Rooster actively trucking, I mean, it was just kind of, just kind of raised in it. I, I would have a hard time dealing with the hours, I think, if I hadn't just been raised in it. So if you're someone that came into cow trucking from another world, so to speak, big props, because it's a lot. Not only are the hours just insane and outrageous, you have to know livestock. You have to understand when they're distressed. You have to understand, it. you know, the psychology of a, of an animal so that you know how to handle them properly. You have to be a top-notch truck driver because it's a live load, it's a shifty load, and it's a load that doesn't allow you to necessarily just pull over and call it a night. You know, you have to get them there. Once you put them in, it's like, okay, whether your truck breaks down, that's another thing. You have to be pretty mechanical, uh, pretty good at Jimmy jury rigging things because uh, <laughs> you kind of have to figure out how to get down the road. Um, just it, it takes a lot of a lot of things and I, I'm not tooting my horn I just want you like I said initially you just gotta it, there's a lot it's a lot it's this week was to be honest with you for me mentally uh, it was it was a little much and that's part of why I didn't get to share as much as I would have liked it was it was a little more than I like to to do but it had to be done last year I made a huge mistake and, and I pushed myself way too hard. I never did anything dangerous. I never had any issues or any close calls or anything like that. I never drive tired. Um, I can always pull over and, and take a nap and I mean that. I never drive sleepy is what I mean. Tired, you're all tired all the time, but um, I never drive sleepy to where I'm in danger of falling asleep and wrecking. Um, it's just not worth it for that. But. Um, Last year I pushed myself too hard to where I, I had to step away from Cal Holland for several months because I, like just the thought of it, the sight of it, was just like, nope, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. I will not, I am not. And it took it took about six or eight months for me to get back in the saddle, as, as, serious, as, as strange as that sounds, but I had just burned myself out. I pushed too hard. I did way too many 5,000, 6,000 mile weeks, which are just horrible. And anyway, I learned my lesson from it and I've done a much better job this year of taking good care of myself. So uh, that's good. Nobody's immune from that by any means. So I hope you enjoyed again. Like I said, you guys, I really appreciate the support. Uh, it is holiday season. If you haven't had the chance, check out the website. Um, I always put it in the link below. 
you have any questions or uh, any things you need to email about, I usually put a, the email link down there as well. Um, merchandise, I have, I have a fair bit left, but it's starting. I'm starting to run out of some of the certain sizes and, and uh, product lines, so to speak. And I don't plan on on reprinting things. Once they're gone, they're gone, and I'll come up with something different to replace it with. But uh, once they're gone, they're gone, and uh, they're getting down that way. So anyway, y'all been good. I'm going to get home and uh, take a long shower and uh, enjoy the family and have a great 